Let us pray. Mighty God, our strength and hope, you have not left us on our own, struggling to find you without direction. Rather, you've come among us. And in the scriptures of the synagogue and the church, you have given us the reliable record of your presence. Open anew the meaning of what we've read, that by the gifts of your Holy Spirit, we may be strengthened and sent forth to do the work in the world through Christ, who is the living word. Amen. Well, good morning on this beautiful Sunday morning. Only in North Carolina can we have winter and spring in a period of five days. It's a joy to be with you this day. If you noticed my sermon title, I'll explain it a bit. There's a relatively new term that's being used by young adults in our culture. It's it's the verb adulting. Perhaps you've heard it. Perhaps you've used it. Now, Urban Dictionary defines adulting as carrying out one or more of the duties and responsibilities expected of a fully developed individual. Merriam-Webster states that to adult is to behave like an adult, to do the things that adults regularly have to do. This includes things like having a job and living independently, sure. But it also includes mundane tasks such as taking clothes to the dry cleaners and remembering to pick them up, or making and keeping dental appointments, getting your car registered, doing yard work. In my family, Brandon, who is now stationed in Fairbanks, Alaska, has had to do quite a bit of adulting over the past three months. From 4,000 miles away, I was asked to provide some guidance as he purchased his first vehicle, which resulted in several exasperated sighs, as I mentioned things like interest rates and car insurance. And on a couple of occasions, he even said to me, and Amy, I'm going to have to hang up now because you're making me angry. At least he was honest. Now, I haven't heard from him since the government shutdown, but he's learning a lot about what it means to grow up. And I'm sure he's saying what lots of young adults say these days. Adulting. Adulting is hard. In our gospel lesson this morning, we find the only scripture lesson that gives us a picture of Jesus in his tweens. Oh, scholars have found an apocryphal writing, which means that it was probably fictitious, called the Infant Gospel of Thomas, which is thought to have been written in the second century and talks about Jesus as a young boy between the ages of five and 12. And if you want to read an entertaining and thoroughly fictional account of Jesus as a young boy, let me recommend to you Lamb, the gospel according to Biff, Jesus' childhood pal, that was written by Christopher Moore. But in our New Testament library, we have just this one passage from Luke 2, where Jesus, at the age of 12, is doing a bit of adulting himself only quite a bit younger than we expect it today. As we just heard, Jesus' had parents had taken him to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when the festival was done, Mary and Joseph pack up to return to Nazareth with those who we might call today their tribe, their family, their neighbors, their friends who had traveled with them. And unbeknownst to them, Jesus does not go with them. Rather, Luke tells us that Jesus stayed in the temple, which he'll later describe to his mother as his father's house. 
And there he's learning from and he's sharing with the scribes whose vocation it was to, to teach others the intricacies of the law. And when Jesus' parents realize he's missing, they return to Jerusalem and find him there in the temple. And then after what we can only imagine is a, a mixture of, of relief and exasperation, you know how that is, you want to hug him and choke him at the same time. Jesus returned with his parents to Nazareth. And Luke tells us that Jesus was obedient to them. And he increased in favor and in wisdom and with divine and human favor. This morning is the third part of a, a four-part series in which we're focused on our purpose. Our purpose as those who are called to, in the words of Alan Hidden, to love God whole lifedly by obeying what Jesus declared was the greatest commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And a couple of gospel writers even include and with all your strength. Or in the words of Eugene Peterson's The Message, love the Lord your God with all your passion and all your prayer and all your intelligence. And this morning, we're focused specifically on what it means, what it looks like to love God with all of our minds. In this passage from Luke's Gospel, we come to see that Jesus, both as a young boy and then later throughout his adult ministry, that Jesus spent considerable time studying and sometimes even wrestling with his growing self-understanding that he was God's son and what that meant for his life. I also think it's important to note that when Jesus shared what he said was the greatest commandment, Jesus is quoting a, a portion of the Shema from Deuteronomy 6, the, the centerpiece of Jewish morning and evening prayer services. A prayer that Jesus had been taught as a young boy. A prayer which described the way that he was to live out his faith. He was to love God with his whole being and to teach that to his children and, and he was to recite it when he woke up and when he lay down at night. And so for Jesus, a, a holistic love of God encompassed more than just our passion and our feelings, loving God with our whole heart. It was also about obedience accomplished through rational thought, through study. Through study, we learn what we're faithfully to do. To love God with all of our mind is to be a learner. It's important to remember that when Jesus sat down in the temple with those teachers of the law, he, he had, wasn't gathering them together for the first time for the scribes and, and later for the rabbis, it was normal for them to come together and debate the meaning of the Hebrew scriptures and how those might be applied to their lives and to the lives of others. As we seek to love God with our whole mind, we're invited to do the same, to study, to question, to wrestle with how we might live into the scriptures that we find in the Old and New Testaments. When I served as a district superintendent and consulted with pastor parish committees about their hopes and desires in a new pastor and in what Bill described as our time of moving folks around, I was quite disheartened by the number of pastor parish committees that I would go and meet with and they would say to me, well, Amy, we want a pastor. We want a pastor who preaches the Bible. And I think to myself, well, okay. I thought that was a given. <laughs> what I quickly learned was that was code language. Code language for we want a pastor who will preach exactly what we already believe. And you know, I have to wonder. 
I have to wonder about how some of the God said it, I believe it, and that settles it theology that has emerged um, in our culture today. If it doesn't come out of a, an individualistic understanding of the Christian faith. That pervasive idea that, that faith is primarily about me and Jesus and nobody else. And I have to wonder, I have to wonder whether we in the Western world have gotten it wrong. What if the most faithful, what if the most fruitful study of our holy scriptures is done in community, in small groups? where we hear and consider different perspectives and receive feedback on our own understanding. You know, left to my own devices, I can make the Bible say pretty much whatever I want it to say. But in a group, I'm held accountable. I'm held accountable to a more accurate rendering in fact, the witness of the scripture is that most study of the scriptures was done in groups. Teachers of the law together in the temple. Twelve disciples who were taught by Jesus as they traveled together. The apostles as they went into synagogues to share the good news of Jesus Christ. The early church as they gathered together in homes to study, to worship, to fellowship. I think certainly that's why Sunday school classes and life groups are so important as our growth as disciples. And I want to challenge you not only to participate in such a group, but maybe even if you are a part of a group, to, to shift the focus of that group a bit. If necessary, do a rigorous, honest, dedicated time of study. Now, I'm not saying that that individual time of, of devotion and, and prayer and, and scripture reading um, isn't something we should do. But what I am saying is that I think that it needs to be balanced. It needs to be balanced with time in a group where we can receive and give insight. Researchers have come to know what I, I think our early religious teachers knew long ago. And that is that one of the most effective ways for us to learn is through peer learning. As groups with similar interests or goals or job responsibilities come together and share in common activities and they learn from one another. And as we think about our participation in these small groups, as strange as it may sound, I want to invite you to, as a part of that learning community, to adopt the humble attitude that I just might be wrong. I just might be wrong. I might be wrong and you might be right. I might be wrong and you might have something to teach me. I might be wrong and, and that's true because God is infinitely greater than my limited knowledge and I need to embrace your point of view in order to gain a fuller understanding. I do have to wonder what a difference that kind of attitude would make in Congress. But I love the way that Lauren Winner describes her own limited understanding of God in her book, Wearing God. She says, I can't describe God in the same way that I can't describe a picture that I'm holding up millimeters from my eyes. The picture is made strange and unknowable, not because it's distant, but because it's so close. Or I cannot describe God in the same way that I describe the, can't describe the collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, for there's to, so much there for me to describe. To come out of the muse museum and tell you about the one blue bowl that I looked at for hours, doesn't tell you about the museum. There's always so much more to be seen. God is nearer and more than I can say. So to love God is to be a learner. It's to be a learner in a community of other disciples who help each other to know God in deeper and fuller ways.
my friends, while learning is essential, it's also only a means to an end. As important as learning is, we learn so that we might act. I don't learn to speak Spanish just so I can go around and tell people, well, I know how to speak Spanish. And I don't learn Spanish in a class so that I can just speak Spanish with those folks that are sitting around me in that class. Rather, I learn to speak Spanish so I can communicate better with my neighbors and my colleagues for whom that is their first language. It's a means to an end. Philippians 2 describes the goal, the end of our learning as faithful disciples. Let this mind, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped. But Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. To love God with all of our mind is to have the same mind as Christ as we so humbly serve others to the glory of God. I think that's why when Jesus shared the greatest commandment, he continued, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see, I, the two are inextricably linked. As you love God whole lifedly, you love others. The people in Haiti, your brothers and sisters at St. John's, the guests that come to room in the inn, the students who attend Freedom School, the residents of Greer Heights, those in this community who don't know the love and the joy that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And as you love them, you love God. The mission of this church is to be the growing body of Christ, glorifying God and serving others. It's to be the growing body of Christ, glorifying God and serving others. As you love God with all of your mind, may you do just that. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.